Uh, out of your contemporaries when you were starting off, right through your career, or even musicians now, what, what musicians, artists, and even guitarists have you felt particularly inspired or impressed by over the years? Who do I find inspiring, particularly guitarists? Sorry? In any point in your career, when you're starting out or, or now? Um, I, my heroes are still the same, actually, as when I was growing up. You know, as a teenager, I went to see Eric Clapton at Eel Pie Island and was blown away, you know, and I'm still blown away by the guy. He's very different uh, these days from what he was, but, you know, there's, there's a colossal talent there. And he was one of the torchbearers. He led Britain into rock music, really, which was the preserve of Americans uh, until that time, along with the Beatles, you know, and I love the Beatles. I love Jimi Hendrix. I still absolutely fall at the feet of Jeff Beck, who I think is probably the most creative living guitarist. Um, so it doesn't change. Thankfully, there's a lot of young people coming up who are also very good, you know, and I feel just the same. And I, I get a, an incredible thrill from working with any of these people. And I, I, I never get over that feeling of being a fan. You know, I love um, working with young bands as, as well as, as people who were my heroes when I was growing up. Um, so I got to play the, the March of the Black Parade not long ago, you know, and that to me was a, a great thrill. I get to play with the Foo Fighters, you know, who were, could, you know, could, be my, uh, could be my progeny for all I know. Um, you know, and that's a thrill. It doesn't have to be people who are older than me to, to actually feel that, uh, that feeling of respect and excitement. Um, so that I, I always think that's, that's one of my greatest pleasures that comes from what I've achieved, whatever that is. You know, I, I didn't do it because I wanted to become famous. George Harrison said it very well. He said, you know, I asked to be successful. I didn't ask to be famous. And I sort of feel like George, I think. You know, he, he plunged into his art. He enjoyed it. He used his art as a vehicle towards his spiritualism. He tried to make the world a better place. And as an overall rounded human being, George Harrison, to me, is a great inspiration. Um, so that's probably enough, right? <laughs> um, what was your favorite Queen concert to perform? Favorite Queen concert? Yeah. Ah, that would be very hard. I suppose... I suppose Live Aid, because it was such a great um, confirmation to us that we actually did um, have something to say. You know, I think we were going through a little bit of a crisis of confidence, and we thought if we, you know, we'd been away recording and stuff, and, and we thought that having built up this wonderful show, you know, with the big lights, the big sound, the big show, the big drama and everything, we kind of thought that the show was us. In Live Aid, we had to go out there without the accoutrements. We didn't have our own light show. We didn't have our own sound. We went on in jeans and, and T-shirts and whatever. And it worked. The other thing was we weren't even playing to a Queen audience. We were playing to 100,000 people who had all bought their tickets before we'd been announced. So we were playing to the general public. And the feeling of going on at that moment was incredible. It, it was a real kind of, um, a sort of testing time, I suppose. And it worked just great, particularly Freddie. We had a couple of unfair advantages because we'd already done football stadiums around the world. We, we kind of knew how to handle that situation. And we also had Freddie, who was a natural. Freddie just had that ability to make everybody feel part of it, even though they were at the very back of the stadium. I think everybody who watched Freddie, you know, young people who had dreams, felt that they could achieve their dreams because Freddie had achieved his. So I would say Live Aid. Um, now that we're firmly grounded in Queen, as it were, <laughs> Will we ever hear about what actually happened in the legendary Queen parties? <laughs> You've heard it all already, haven't you? I don't think I can tell you. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Queen fan, I was wondering how um, you and Roger Taylor, when you were writing songs, both of you really good singers, how did you decide which songs to sing yourself and record yourself and which songs to give to Freddie to sing? Oh, <clears throat> um, there's not an easy answer to that really. Uh, it's a curious situation where you have four artists with paintbrushes trying to paint on the same canvas. That's the situation you're in in the studio. And it's a process of argument and give and take. 
as to what happens. We had a kind of unwritten law between the four of us that the person who came in with the idea first would get the final say. But during the process of the development of the song and of the track, everyone would pitch in, and there would be kind of bloody arguments, to be honest. Um, and then is the question of who sings it. Well, in the beginning, I, I think I was writing quite personally, and even having Fred around, I sort of felt there were certain things that I wanted to express in my own way. But as time went on, we realised more and more, and Roger's the same. Roger's a good singer, like you say. You know, we realised more and more we had this incredible vehicle in Freddie, uh, you know, a unique vocalist, able to interpret things. And sometimes you have to let go. If, if you give a song to someone, you can't control how they perform it. You have to step back and allow them to put themselves into it. And once I got into that frame of mind, I just realised that everything got better as soon as Freddie sang it. So I, I think both Roger and I got to the point where we didn't want to sing on the albums anymore. We just wanted Freddie to do his thing because it was so precious. Hi, Brian. Um, is there any moment in your musical career that you would say you've been most proud of? The moment when you've thought, I've done something fantastic We're going to talk here. music now, eh? All right. <laughs> Instantly, we all relax. <laughs> um, there's a number of moments. I suppose the, um, the top of Buckingham Palace, really. <laughs> and people say, was it scary? Well, yes, it was scary. They say, well, did you think you were going to fall off? And I go, no, I don't think I was going to fall off. But if I'd messed it up, I would have thrown myself off. <laughs> <laughs> because I would have been the guy who woke up the next morning and screwed up on top of Buckingham Palace in front of a million people. So that was, in, for me, it was an adventure, it was a challenge, and it was an, an absolute life-changing moment because I had to face that fear and get through it and, and, regain, and keep composure. Um, I also think I was doing it for a number of reasons. I was, in a sense, representing 50 years of the Queen's reign. In a sense, I was representing 50 years of rock and roll. And in a sense, I was up there because Freddie's no longer around and I would be the one to sort of wave the banner. So it was a great feeling and I was fucking terrified. I will tell you. <laughs> Sorry, you can edit that out. Um, <laughs> and when it was done, you'll see that the, the pictures of it, you know, I put my hand in the air and I thanked God because there is so much preparation you could do, but there was so much that could go wrong. And um, I learned a great thing in a depression clinic some years ago, which is called the Serenity Prayer, which I'd like to share with you, since you've reminded me. And this helped me through, and what it says is God, it, God doesn't have to be a part of it, but God's a convenient rock to put this on. It says, God, give me the grace to recognize the things over, over which I have no control, the courage to change the things that I can change, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, it's a bit of a paraphrase. I'll try again. <laughs> Higher power, or God, grant me the grace to understand that there are things which I cannot change. Grant me the courage to change the things I can, and grant me the wisdom to know the difference. So in other words, in that situation where you feel fear, and all you can feel is that fear, you just concentrate on the things which you can achieve and the rest of it you have to abandon to a higher power and that's I don't know if that's religion or not but it's a very powerful tool because as soon as you abandon certain things to a higher power they're lifted from you you can't worry about it anymore you have to just worry on the things which you can control like is the thing in tune <laughs> does, the, does the why work but you can't control the weather you can't control the fact of I mean I had a, an orchestra a hundred yards away if I'd been able to hear them they would have been out of time so we had all sorts of systems where I could hear the orchestra, they could hear me, I could see the conductor on the TV screen. Half an hour before the performance, none of it worked. And they said, we'll have to run another wire up through the palace. And this official man said, we can't do that without asking the Queen. And uh, <laughs> it was like, yes, we can, because it won't work. So they got me the wire, and it, I think it was about 10 minutes before the actual thing when everything worked, and suddenly I had huge monitors behind me where I could hear the orchestra live. I had my lovely big amps to make it my big noise and I was in the middle and it was once I conquered that fear, once I jumped in, it was it was a moment of heaven. It was a moment of, of jubilation, just enjoying the sound and, 
and enjoying the fact that I knew I'd prepared as much as I could. You're all going to get exams soon, aren't you? It's the same thing, you know. You know, you think, why did I do this? Why did I do this? You know, and this is awful. But actually, you prepare, and then you have to abandon the rest to a higher power because there are certain things you can't control. My dad used to say, you can only do your best, and your best will be good enough. Does that answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> This is going to be the killer, isn't it? <laughs> no, not very. <laughs> well, thank you very much for an amazing talk, Dr. May. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I've just got a couple of questions about your musical instrument side. Um, you're well known as a guitarist, um, but are there any other instruments which you would like to be able to play, or any other instruments that you do play? Um, and also, my dad does own one of your guitars, and he absolutely loves it. <laughs> mm, good. Well, regards to your dad. That's great. Um, I would like to be able to play the piano better. I played a bit, I used to play a little bit on tour as well, but I don't have that facility where I can sit down at the piano and play what's in my head. I can more or less do that on the guitar, but the piano is such a wonderful graphic polyphonic instrument that it would be great to have my fingers um, knowing what they were doing. Having said that, it's quite curious because sometimes when you sit down at a keyboard and you don't know what you're doing, unusual things happen and sometimes the unusual things are very interesting and inspiring so it can lead you in a good direction but I wish I could perform on the piano uh, to me that would be a great joy I gave up piano playing at grade three you did grade eight I did. your chairman did grade eight piano and goes no I don't do it anymore so I hope you will take it up again but um, to me yes I'd, I'd like to, to have a facility on the piano I probably never will um, but my music is all in the ears. I, I can read music, but very slowly, and I can write music, but pitifully badly. You know, talking about writing on a, on a piece of paper. But what I can do is hear it, and I can communicate it, and that, to me, is, is, is what motivates me, and, that, and that's what makes it all work for me. Um, that's it, I think, really. I'm very happy, though. I mean, the, the guitar, to me, is such an expressive instrument. You can put it in the hands of anyone who has even a minimum qualification and they will do something interesting with it. It seems like the guitar has an ability to interpret people's feelings, the unconscious wills of people, as well as the conscious wills. Uh, I think a great example is Kurt Cobain, you know, who was by no means a technician on the guitar, but was able to produce an enormous emotional effect on his audience by playing just the way he felt. And uh, so the guitar to me is, is a bit of a miraculous instrument and I'm happy that I got to, to be a guitarist. It's my voice. Uh, yeah, final question. Him, if you could collaborate with any artist, performing or writing, who would you pick? Who would I collaborate with? It would be John Lennon, I think, but it's not gonna happen, is it? <laughs> great choice. Yeah, that would be great. I never met him. Um, I met all the other Beatles, but not John, and, and I regret it. I wasn't allowed to go when I was a kid. My mum said, no, 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 we don't go to things like that. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a bit sad, so I, I didn't get the opportunity to see the Beatles live, you know. But to me, you know, his music is, is so anchored to the soul and so blindingly honest. That's the kind of thing that I aspire to in, in music. Um, we're going to play, I'm going to play at some Pancras Station um, on Friday, is it on Friday? You know, in aid of uh, Tiger Tracks. Sorry? What about Jimi Hendrix? Yeah, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, oh, that would be good, but you know, it would be, it would be tough to play with Jimi. <laughs> <laughs> I would feel uh, inadequate, I think. But John, but John Lennon I would enjoy. Um, yeah, so I, I think at, at Tiger Tracks we're going to play this little known song by John Lennon. Uh, and it's called, I think it's called Bungalow Bill. Anybody know it? It's a song about people going out to hunt tigers and uh, thinking themselves very brave. So it very much fits in, much fits in with, with my view of, of uh, how we should be behaving towards animals. So if you want to come to St Pancras Station, you've got nothing to do, Friday night, um, I'll see you there. <laughs> the, yeah, the lady at the front. How have you managed to stay so down to earth given that you are essentially a legend? Oh, I love you. Uh, <laughs> I like being called a ledge, it's lovely. Um, well, thank you for saying that I'm down to earth. It's just, 
it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> she says I'm down to earth. I mean, this is your perception, and I thank you for it. I, to me, it's just my own kind of truth, I suppose. I like the act. I, I like being a rock star or whatever, you know, and I'll do it to the max, and I'll be epic and whatever, you know, but inside there's a person who's sort of looking at it and thinking, you know, where am I, what am I doing, what does this mean? And as time has gone on, I felt it more appropriate to reveal what I actually am, and it seems to help in the live situation. I recently did a tour with, with a lady that I work with, Kerry Ellis, who you know very well, and um, we abandoned all the big show. We went out there just very simple, an acoustic guitar and a voice, occasional keyboards, and there was no pretense whatsoever. We told stories, we had a laugh with the audience, and um, so we kind of climbed down off the pedestal, if you like, and to me, I love that kind of thing. I, I like just being normal, and I think to be truthful, I've fought in my life to, to stay as normal as I can, it's a pretty abnormal life that I've had, but you have to be a human being, and you're not excused from being a human being just because you're famous or successful. Uh, you have to answer to your kids, who will tear you apart at every opportunity. I have to answer to my grandchildren now. They'll tear you apart as well, except they do it in a more loving way. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think you just got to wake up every morning and, and be able to look into the mirror and say, yeah, I'm, I'm telling the truth as far as I can in my, in my life. So I thank you for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh...